Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the Logitech G Cloud handheld gaming device. This is geared towards game streaming, either in the home or from a service, but it's actually pretty decent as an Android gaming handheld as well. And we're going to take a closer look at this and see all the different things you can do with it in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this handheld is all about. Now the price point on this comes in at around $349. I was a bit disappointed with the high price tag on this because... It is priced in the neighborhood of game consoles that have a very fleshed out game library, whereas this device either runs with mobile games like you're seeing here uh, or with uh, streaming services that you're going to have to pay a monthly fee for. More on that in a little bit. The good news is that the high price does get you a pretty high quality piece of hardware here. This is really nice to hold. I really like the way it feels. It looks pretty nice. It's got a gorgeous 7 inch 1080p display that's running at 450 nits. It's nice and bright. It runs at a 60 hertz uh, refresh rate and even games like Sonic the Hedgehog here that have a lot of motion uh, seem to be working uh, really nicely here without a lot of blur. The overall weight is pretty nice on it too. It's only about a pound or 455 grams. So it's very well balanced to hold in the hand. They have these really nice handles here that are sculpted in that uh, make it something that can work pretty well over a long play session. So it just feels comfortable, a lot more comfortable than the Nintendo Switch feels. And it's about the same size as the Switch. The controls are really nice on it as well. You've got these great analog sticks. Uh, they are very smooth and accurate. It just feels like a very mature control surface here. And of course, Logitech has been making this kind of hardware as an accessory item for PCs for decades now. The D-pad also works out pretty nice. I would like a little bit more travel on it, but it really uh, works well for games like Sonic the Hedgehog here as we're playing through. So I have uh, no complaints on the controls whatsoever. They feel great. On the top here, you've got an analog trigger set, which has a good range of motion to it along with uh, left and right uh, shoulder buttons here. Uh, the other buttons here are nicely sized and well spaced. And then of course you've got your home button for the Android interface, buttons that map up with uh, some of the game streaming services you might use and a Logitech button here that will function in different ways depending on what you're using. Now one thing that I noticed with this though is that it doesn't seem to support rumble in any of the streaming apps that I tried with it. It does have a vibration motor for interacting with the Android environment, but it appears as though during gameplay, you're not gonna feel rumble on these controllers. Now for its specifications, it has a Qualcomm Snapdragon 720G processor. This is very similar to what we saw in the Google Pixel 4a mid-range smartphone from a couple of years ago. It's adequate for the task, especially for game streaming, but it's also pretty good at casual Android games out there too, so you do have a good amount of performance here, but it's not going to rival a Nintendo Switch or a Steam Deck. It has 64 gigabytes of onboard storage. I found I had about 45 gigabytes free when I first booted it up, but you do have the option to add an SD card here at the top if you want to augment that. It has four gigabytes of RAM on board and it's running Android 11 with a custom launcher, as you can see here. And one of the things you'll notice with this launcher is that when you load up an app, it will ask you to close the app that was already open. So it's really aggressive about maintaining its performance and closing out background applications. You do though have the option uh, to switch it into its tablet mode here. So if we go over to the settings and go down to uh, the device information screen here and switch into tablet mode, you can turn this into a run-of-the-mill Android tablet. Now there's no fingerprint reader on this device, nor is there a camera, so you do have to type in your pin code every time you switch the launcher mode or just turn it on and off. The other thing I noticed here when you're in tablet mode is that even if you have your auto screen rotate on here, the screen will not rotate, so I suspect it lacks an accelerometer for detecting the screen orientation. But beyond that, it works very well as a tablet, if that's your thing. I have found there are a few apps that work better in the tablet mode versus the game launcher mode, and I'll talk about one of those in a few minutes. And then to switch back into the other mode here, you just tap on that icon and switch modes. So it's a little more work to get into tablet mode than to get out of it, 
but I think for most folks, they'll probably stay in the interface here. Now, a surprise that they did not ship this with a Wi-Fi 6 radio on board. It is using a 2x2 two two AC radio. It performs fine. I'm connecting it right now to a Wi-Fi 6 access point, which of course is backwards compatible. And I'm getting anywhere between 400 and 480 megabits per second on the downstream and about the same on the upstream. I have a multi-gigabit connection here, but a Wi-Fi 6 radio would be a little faster and Wi-Fi 6 tends to do a little better when you have a congested network environment. But if you're the only one on your access point or other folks in the house are not using it all that heavily, it should perform well for game streaming as you'll see in a few minutes, but Wi-Fi 6 would have been a better choice for a device like this, especially at its price. Now it charges here at the bottom with its USB Type-C port. You do get an AC adapter and a cable in the box, but of course any USB-C power source will work with it. It's actually got really nice stereo sound on it. Very impressive sound actually for a tablet device. So I was very pleased with that. And you can also connect Bluetooth headphones or plug in regular headphones here to its headphone jack, which is something you don't always see on portable devices these days. The battery life on this is exceptional. Uh, they say it's rated for about 12 hours. I say it'll depend on what you're doing with it. If you are game streaming, I think 10 to 11 hours is definitely feasible. Uh, but if you are playing Android games that will work the processor harder, you'll see less battery life than that. But it does a lot better than the Steam Deck might with a game that is very demanding because if you're able to stream the game from the cloud, you're able to play for a lot longer on this handheld versus the Steam Deck, which has to run it locally with a lot more power. Now, unfortunately though, the USB Type-C port does not output video. So you're not going to be able to dock this to a larger display like you can with a Steam Deck. So just be aware of that. This does though work with some USB-C data devices. So you could plug in a keyboard or a mouse. You could also plug in some storage devices. I did though find that ethernet did not work on it. We tried connecting an ethernet adapter and while it did shut the Wi-Fi off, it didn't actually connect to the network. So this is going to be mostly a handheld device and not something you're going to dock and use on a larger display. So let's take a look and see how this performs at its stated purpose, which is game streaming. And we're gonna try GeForce Now here to start and we'll look at a few other things also. Uh, if there is a streaming app that you currently use on your phone, there's a good chance it's going to work here if it's in the Google Play Store. And this controller is recognized by the Android operating system as a game controller, so any app that supports game controllers will work here. So if you have a different app than the ones I am testing, I think you're going to be in good shape. Now, if you are using GeForce Now and you want to make use of the 1080p display, you do have to go into the settings first and go over to uh, your service option and then select the resolution that you want to play in. So I'm gonna go over here to stream quality and make sure that I've got 1080p selected at 60 frames per second. I found that by default, it does 720p. So to get the most out of it, you definitely need to set that first because it doesn't seem to go up to 1080p on its own. But once you're locked in, you are good to go. And what I'm gonna do here is load up No Man's Sky, which is one of my favorite games to play. And this is something that I purchased on my Steam account. And the way GeForce Now works is that it allows you to connect your Steam, Epic, and Ubisoft accounts to them. And you can boot up the games that you've purchased elsewhere on their cloud. So their service is just a service layer for games that you already own. You can't buy games from NVIDIA to play on their service. One thing to note with it though is that not all developers allow their games to be streamed even if you paid for them. So the library of games you have available will be smaller than uh, what might already be in your Steam library. One thing I found though is a couple of little glitchy things here. Uh, this does of course have a microphone option for communicating with other players. And if I grant it uh, permission, sometimes it doesn't always uh, have that message go away, although this time it did because we are recording the video now, but earlier it was not going away uh, when I granted that permission. But we're gonna jump into a game here and let it load up. What you can see here in the corner is that we've got a strong signal at 1080p 60. So this game does take a minute or two to load, so let me get it loaded up. And when we're in the game, we'll take a look and see how it performs. All right, here we are playing the game now. We're running at a solid 1080p 60 frames per second. Looking at my router statistics, we're pulling down approximately 30 megabits per second uh, for this stream. So it looks and plays great. 
You do, of course, get a little bit of input lag when you play games over the internet like this, but the lag isn't any worse than it would be on a mobile phone or a computer or a TV device that is also streaming from the same server. So if you're satisfied with the quality of the uh, streaming service that you have now, it should work fine here. GeForce Now does allow you to set the bitrate higher if you want to try to improve the image quality, but I think where I'm at right now, which is the manual setting of 1080p 60 and uh, the game here running on automatic settings for bandwidth, it seems to be working just fine. But you can really see how important it is to have a good solid Wi-Fi connection to be able to maintain uh, this level of performance. So that's something that you're going to need to work out within your home environment. But if you do have a good Wi-Fi signal, you're going to get a lot of battery life out of this thing to play uh, the games that are supported on your streaming service. And in full disclosure, NVIDIA provided this GeForce Now account to the channel free of charge. Let's take a look now at Xbox Cloud Gaming, which is part of the Game Pass Ultimate subscription. So here is Forza 5 running through the Xbox Cloud service. It runs just as nicely here as it does on other smartphones that I have run it on in the past. At the moment, Microsoft is limiting resolution through their cloud gaming app to 720p on Android. So the visuals here will not look as crisp as they might on the GeForce Now service we were just looking at. But the games are very playable. It syncs up with your Xbox console. So if you are a Game Pass subscriber, you can play on the console, save the game, and then jump over to the handheld here and pick up where you last left off in a streaming session. And that can be very convenient, especially if you are heavily invested into that Game Pass ecosystem. So all in, pretty good. I would love to see Microsoft uh, boost the resolution a bit here because we do have a higher resolution display, but it is very playable on this device and looks pretty good despite the low bit rate and resolution. Now in full disclosure, I paid for the Game Pass account with my own funds. Let's take a look now at in-home game streaming. I've got Steam Link running on the handheld, and this is connecting to my game machine upstairs. And this will stream any game on your desktop PC. There's no licensing limitations with in-home game streaming to worry about. So Red Dead Redemption 2, which of course does not work on the NVIDIA GeForce Now service, does work when I stream it from my PC upstairs. And as you can see, it looks great and plays great. I've got it set to 1080p here, which of course is the native resolution of this display. You can also use apps like Moonlight and Rainway and just about anything else that supports in-home streaming uh, because if there's an Android app, it will run on this device and you'll have a good experience here like I am with Red Dead Redemption 2 right now. Now, I do suggest, though, getting your gaming PC plugged into Ethernet for the best performance over your local network. So my PC upstairs is on Ethernet. And then, of course, my Wi-Fi access point here is on the same network and I'm able to stream the game to the handheld. There's also no monthly fee involved with any of these streaming apps as well. So if your intention is just to play some games that you have on your PC, it's not all that hard to set up. It's built right into Steam in this instance, but the other apps are also pretty easy to work with. Now, in addition to streaming games, you can download games off the Google Play Store and run them natively on the handheld. Again, that might come with a little bit of a battery hit, but the games look great. This is called Horizon Chase. I found that most of the games you'll find on the Android App Store are targeting kind of the mid to low end processors out there, which this one has on board. So the game performance on Android should be fine for the most part. I did run a few other games like PUBG and Genshin Impact, but unfortunately those games don't support the game controller and you have to use the touch screen. And because the controllers are in the way, the touch based games are a little harder to work with versus the games that support the controller. So hopefully we'll see better controller support on some of the games that don't currently support it on Android. And for those that do like this one, the experience should be very good for Android games, at least if they are horizontally oriented like this one. And game emulation should be pretty decent on this device. The 8 and 16-bit era, of course, should run fine. I'm also able to get Dreamcast to run pretty nicely on here. This is the ReDream emulator and we're running a game called Propeller Arena, which is running great here. So the performance is a little bit better than you might expect out of a device marketed primarily as a streaming device. It can do the Dreamcast pretty well here, 
Let's take a look and see if it can handle the GameCube. So here we are running Wave Race on the Dolphin emulator, and we're pretty much running this game at its full frame rate, about 30 frames per second here. Now, not every GameCube game is going to run this well. Some won't run at all. Others will be struggling, but there's probably a good chunk of the GameCube library that should be very playable here. So this device really is more than just game streaming. It's actually a pretty good all-round Android uh, gaming handheld, and so far I've been very impressed with all the different things that I have tried on it. And on the 3D Mark Wildlife Benchmark Test, we got a score of 1049, but it's not as powerful as the GPD XP line of Android gaming handhelds. These are kind of a specialty device, but they are very nicely designed. They have faster processors, a little more RAM. They're probably better suited for some of the native Android gaming and emulation than this one will be. But its screen is very wide, and I think the 16 by 9 aspect ratio on the Logitech here works a little better for game streaming. So overall, I found this to be a very robust gaming device that is well constructed, although a bit too expensive, I think, for the market that it's entering. It was interesting to see Logitech focusing almost primarily on game streaming as the target market for this. And I would imagine they have some market research that suggests there's a big market for that over perhaps just general casual Android games. So that's probably why they're focusing there. But it does both, and it does both quite well. I just wish it cost a little less because there are a bunch of other specialty Android devices on the market like the Odin and many others that uh, do perform a little better and cost less. But this has Logitech's name behind it, and I do think there's some value in that but not enough, I think, to justify the high price tag. So if you see a good price on one of these things, definitely check it out. I think you'll be very pleased with what it can do. I certainly am, and I think I might be holding on to this for a little while to do some of my game streaming. That is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.